The Garden of Ink and Bones is a monthly podcast about witchcraft, powerful plants, and making magic. I'm Belle of Belladonna and Bones, and I'll be joined by occult artist Rue of Old Omen, and we're witches who like to get our hands dirty. To us, magic is practical, visceral, and bound in blood to the soil and bones of our spiritual allies. It's time to get your hands into the dirt, do the work, make magic, and feel the witchcraft in your bones. Welcome to the Garden of Ink and Bones. Hello and welcome everyone to episode 7 of the Garden of Ink and Bones. I'm Belle and I'm joined by Rue. Hey everyone. Um, it's been a few weeks. It's been Mercury retrograde, Mars retrograde, all seven fires of hell raining down upon <laughs> us. Um, <laughs> We're late with this podcast. Yeah, look, I, I will freely admit that winter is not my best time. No. I, I'm not a motivated person in winter. Um, and I frankly do not like popping my little head out of my cocoon. <laughs> so oh, I don't blame you. You've been to my house. It's got no heating, high ceilings, and it's over a hundred years old. So I feel like I just shut down. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. So look, n- no excuses guys, but, um, but we may next year t- choose to take a hiatus in, uh, July, <laughs> June, July, <laughs> but uh, yeah, onward and ever upwards. Um, this month we'll be recapping on Richo Church's um, plant medicine um, using wormwood, and then we'll be also talking about Jaja uh, Mika Hardik's A Century of Spells, strange little book indeed, and we'll be talking about rosemary, like common old garden variety rosemary. Yep. So. Um, just a, a few things I wanted to talk about before we got started. Um, one thing is if you are not subscribed to the Circle Thrice newsletter, which is Ivy's newsletter, um, I s- highly recommend you go and subscribe. She's been sending out weekly um, newsletters that have uh, significant astrological dates in them um which are more or not just astrological dates but just magical timing dates as well um so they've been very useful um to me lately so that's circlethrice.com um i'll put a link in the show notes um what else oh you should listen to the astrology podcast again magical timing and things like that um it's at astrologypodcast.com. It's really not hard to find. Um, once a month, at just before the beginning of the month, um, Austin Kopic, Kelly Surtees and Chris, who runs the podcast, he wrote Hellenic Astrology, um, they get together and they have a, a chat through the, the star weather for the month. And, and I found it really useful to understand what's happening. It's all, of course, more useful if you understand your own chart as well, which I'm not very good at. Um, but it was really funny. I was there was something that Austin sent through um, to his group uh, late last week that said uh, around four o'clock on Friday. Well, f- he didn't say around four o'clock on Friday. He gave the Pacific time, um, but for me, it was four o'clock on Friday. Something that um, that you thought was done will come back. And I thought, oh, that's really specific. <laughs> like, how could that be? You know, sometimes I get a bit like that with astrology. Um, but, of course, quarter past four, my phone rings. Someone says, we can't do the event you're planning because um, because there's a big festival on out of town that weekend. And I went, oh. And, like, it was all done and dusted. I'd ordered the printing. I'd ordered all the bits and pieces and had to go around like a chook with a, my head chopped off um, and try to cancel everything. So, yeah, so that for me came up as a really, really strong instance. And I'm going to go back into it further and look at those planets and um, their actions and where they might sit in my birth chart. But I'm on a little bit of an astrology kick right now, <laughs> just <Yeah>. a little. <laughs> just a bit. Aren't you always, though? Yeah, I think it's it's funny because I I struggle. Like I said, I talk about talk to my husband over a lot about um, different types of magic, and and he really struggles with astrology because he feels like you know horoscopes are just 
one size fits all kind yeah. of you can you can make it all fit to your um to your life and i guess the the point is not to look at them from point of view of horoscopes but to look at it as this is a star this is a planets and stars moving and that might make the time useful to do certain things or useful to not do certain things you know mm. i mean our, we're starting in terms of higromantic timing we're starting to record this podcast during the hour of um it's on a sun we're recording on a sunday and um i've lost my piece of paper um no it's during the hour 13 for helping a friend now it doesn't sound like a great idea um you know, for starting a podcast, but it's much, much better than after eight o'clock, which is pre- for preventing an address, you know. So mm. sometimes it's about just double checking that you're not trying to push shit uphill. <laughs> 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 like, you know, because like on Friday, we tried to record on Friday and it was still like Mercury retrograde. And I think it was just a matter of it was not going to happen for us. Like we couldn't oh, make it, it. it. Yeah, it went from what was it, Friday to another day to another day to another day mm. to another day. And then finally we were ready to record two days ago and we had everything set up. And just as I turned my computer on, I just could not get a DNS connection on my computer. So here we are. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's been one of those weeks. Yeah. So, you know, um, in that everything, you know, is is relative and – some people have more worse Mercury retrogrades than others um, and we shouldn't see Mercury retrograde as all doom and gloom. I didn't particularly enjoy this one in concert with the Mars retrograde, but I think it was more the Mars retrograde that um, knocked me on my ass than the, the Mercury retrograde. So, yeah, I'm feeling that. Um, so how did you go with um, Wormwood and Richard Chetch this month? Let's just bundle them all together. Well, I was really hoping to be able to make a wormwood tincture for last month, but we have currently been in a massive, massive drought that's affecting currently 99% of New South yes. Wales. And because it's been so cold and I've been working so much, I haven't been out into the garden a huge amount. And I went out the other day and was just sort of horrified at how much damage some of my plants have had. And my wormwood has like a few little sprigs and almost not much else. Yeah. So I wound up, I had some dried that I'd saved from last year's harvest anyway. So I wound up making, instead of a tincture, I wound up making just bath with it and doing that as sort of a cleansing because there were a few sort of energies that from people that I know, I wanted to sort of try and remove those hooks a bit. So that's what I wound up focusing on. I was really, really hoping to make a tincture, but it has been just hellish trying to keep everything alive here lately. Yeah. How about you? What did you get up to? Well, I ended up making um, Dale Pendel's absinthe. Um, and oh, really? Yeah, and I've um, I've actually made a video of it, but YouTube decided that I was breaking the terms of service somehow. So <laughs> it doesn't seem to like it, so I'm going to have to put it up on Vimeo um, or something like that. But um, we'll work something yeah, cool. out and I'll, I'll let everyone know. And, of course, I did that on Friday at work, you know, because – I had a little bit of quiet time and um, (laughs) I couldn't get it to upload and then forgot to get it off my computer at work. So um, couldn't do it over the weekend. Um, But yeah, it it was fun. It's it's a gorgeous spelling mix. Like um, I've only made a a small adjustment to it, which I'll, you know, I'll save the surprises for the video, but um, it's, it's already ready looking amazingly green. Um, and yeah, smelling wow. just top of the world incredible. So um, I can't wait to drain that out. I should have drained it out today, um, says leave it for a week. Um, but mm, I don't really like just leaving things for a week, so I'll probably leave it from new moon to full because um, I made it on the new moon. Um, yeah, nice. And I'll leave it till the full moon, then I'll then I'll drain it out um, and see how it works. But um, So that was my main Wormwood task this month that's a hell of a lot more exciting that's 
That's really interesting. I'm so curious to see how that turns it out. It was super simple though. Like, you know, it, it's like a lot of, it, it, it's not so much magic as much as it is um, liqueur making, but, um, yeah. but, you know, absinthe has such a history of magic um, with it. Oh, you know, so it's, yeah, yeah, it's one of those things that it's so intriguing and so mysterious and fascinating all at once. Yeah. And you know what? It came along with a really good clean out of the um, magical den. And, um, you know, it's just that time, just trying to get to that good space to start to make things again. Um, yeah. You know, I've got some things going for that winter solstice box I talked about with everyone, but just haven't come up with the right mix of things. Like it just, it hasn't clicked and it might be that I just shouldn't do things in winter. Um, <laughs> but um, I've got some lovely things from Rue uh, to go into it and, um, you know, and it'll just keep evolving until it's at its right stage to go out into the world. So um, I'll, let, I'll let everyone know when that happens. But, yeah, this month not much harvesting. Obviously the garden's pretty dormant, you know, not as dormant as yours because we're blessed not to have the um, the drought um, affecting us down here. And plus um, my garden is pretty well irrigated as well. Um, but we'll see yeah. through summer we'll probably switch on to restrictions water restrictions anyway um and that's why my water my garden is irrigated because it it's much more efficient to irrigate it um but yeah the drought has been absolutely terrible up there and for those around the world who don't know um we're we nine year nine of this drought so mm. yeah um look in some ways it's it's an absolutely horrible thing for farmers and their families and um and the human impact of it um in some ways i think it will help us change some of our farming practices um you know because we do have issues with where we grow what and um what we choose to grow in certain areas but you know definitely there's amazing parts of australia in new south wales that are doing what they were supposed to be doing. It's just now what they're supposed to be doing has to change because the, yeah. the environment doesn't support it anymore. No, that's completely right. And we actually went out. Um, a good family friend of ours has like 5,000 acres pretty west into New South Wales and, you know, we often go up there and we are up there recently and it's, it's bone dry. It's sort of the worst they've ever seen it and like there's been years before where they've had to sort of go through and shoot cattle because there's just nothing to sustain them and they're doing sort of what you're talking about they're trying to find better ways to manage everything and looking at um storing hay and things underground because you can get a better shelf life out of it but it is it's pretty dire at this point and I mean there's even kids in part of New South Wales that have actually never seen rain their entire life like you said it's been going for nine years in some places so it's pretty crazy that is kind of horrifying. Um, yeah. You sort of go, what's going to be like in 10 years' time? <laughs> yeah, that's it. And uh, maybe that's a, a good um, a good place to put some of our magical intentions as, as an Australian magic community, you know, um, is to, to bring the right amount of rain to those areas to help them survive. <coughs> Um, I don't think that big magic like that is is necessarily as futile as sometimes you you might feel it is, you know. Um, so I think every little bit of magic helps um, yeah. with that sort of thing. One of the um, the interesting things my my second cousin is a water dowser by trade, and he gets employed by cattle stations to go out and douse for water and it's really amazing watching him work because not only does he like find where they are he lays down on the ground with if you've ever seen the metal rods that they hold and when he holds them it'll beat up and down tapping the ground wow and it'll tap the amount of times to tell you indicate how many feet down the water is so he doesn't just tell you where it is he'll tell you how far deep to drill and he's been correct 
every single time. It's really, really fascinating to watch. But he uh, did all the boring for the friend's property as well, and it's it's really, really cool to watch. It's a different kind of magic that I think that could be pretty handy in our climate if more people sort of thought about it. And I I can do it. I can't detect how deep it goes, but I can detect waterways. But it's something that you can do at home that's sort of fun to do. Just get two pieces of metal and give them a small handle to a longer length and, yeah, see what you sort of pick up. You can do it with the pipes in your house as well. Cool. Um, so oh, that's really fascinating. I've, I've never had any exposure to water divining in, in any way like that. Um, it's amazing. Yeah. So, so this month we're talking about rosemary and jaja Mikaharik's A Century of Spells. Let's start with A Century of Spells. It's a crazy little book um, about ooh, how many pages? Maybe 150 pages? I think, yeah. Yeah. Um, I first picked this book up about six, seven years ago when I think Sarah Ann Lloydless um, mentioned it on her blog. Um, it bills itself as containing more than 100 useful spells from magical traditions from all over the world. Learn how to cast spells with water, incense, oils, herbs, and spoken and written words, and more importantly, learn how to reverse any spell cast. Um, hmm. it's, it's a weirdly... Oh, it's a weird mishmash. Um, so the author was born in Bosnia immigrated to um, the U.S. in 1939 um, and, yeah, pr practiced magic for a very long time. This book was published in 1988, so it is 30 years old and it does have sort of some of those, I guess, some of the New age influence of the time um, in terms of how... Um, how to take magic? Did you find that? Like, yeah, and like I noticed that one of the things that he mentions in the beginning of the book is that to treat it more like a workbook rather than, you know, a recipe book. I guess you could say, but yeah, it sort of had that, like you said, that sort of early nineties feel of like witchcraft is this new exciting thing that's back more into the forefront of mainstream and it was very very mismatched like one of the things that I found most confusing about it was in the beginning it almost feels like he's condemning witchcraft and talking from almost like a Christian sounding point of view but then you start reading the book and it's like he's giving this warning of like you know oh be careful what you're doing and you know it it's wrong and bad but then you've written an entire book on witchcraft and I don't know I found it a bit confusing at times yeah it has those moments like it it has the um the first two chapters one on protection spells and then the second one well two and a one and a half chapters because I do like some of the reversing spells um are really uh really just like he talks about karma and he talks about I think it's just a one of there's that hangover from Wicker and that of the don't do anything bad. Yeah. For heaven's sake, don't use your magic for bad. <laughs> that, that's um, something I actually uh, wanted to discuss with you because that was one of the things that really stood out to me is that it seemed like like at one point he's talking about, you know, how if you curse anyone or do anything negative, then it's going to come back to you in your next life. And it's it's that, that feeling of Wicker of that, yeah, you know, Heart, what is it? Harm none. Yeah, yeah, and then and the law of thrice return and stuff. Yeah, um, and yeah. So so it has its terrible moments. Um, I think if you go into it looking for magical tech things you can use, then it's a great book, and it's really cheap. Like it's it's like fourteen dollars. Um, you can pick it up secondhand cheaper than that. Um, but it has some really stupid things in it, one being the first spell First spell I have bookmarked, um, which is reversing a spell with water. And he wants you to take a, a baby food jar, a small, small jar. Oh, yeah, um, this one. 
yeah, put a bunch of pins in it, um, put the lid on it, and then put it in the fire until the whole jar explodes. Yeah, and it's like, and then you're meant to right away collect all the broken pieces of glass <laughs> and like take them out and you know throw them out. But I'm just like, yeah, I don't know. That same thing crossed my mind of why would you suggest anyone do this? Yeah, it's it's incredibly dangerous, and it does say no one should be in the room. It's like no shit, show. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, that was that was really just off the wall, and I think that's the. To me, it's like the quintessential point of a lot of these magic books and any magic book, I guess. Look at the spell. If it looks like a really dumb idea, don't do it. No, yeah. <laughs> common sense. But by um, by contrast, the very next spell was reversing a spell with fire, and um, it's. He purports it to be uh, Brazilian, um, and I really liked it. Was um, take your small candle, place it in the dirt. Um, while it's lit, allow the flame to stabilize. With a sudden motion, take the candle from the dirt and reverse it, extinguishing it in the dirt. Then bite the burnt end off the candle and light it again, saying, "As the candle flame is reversed, so let all that opposes me be reversed. As the flame has perished in dirt." Let those who opposed me come to nothing in their work. I really liked it. It's a really simple little um, mm. little spell and it just works, I think. I've, I've also seen that one in um, a lot of hoodoo texts too and you can purchase candles specifically for this purpose where half the candle is white and half the candle is black oh. and doing pretty much the same thing that he's talking about. But, yeah, I, I did find a few spells in here that I really did like. Like there was another one that he mentioned that I hadn't really heard of before using war or iron water. Oh, yep. Yeah, taking a bunch of pins and putting them into water and allowing them to rust and then using either that water for protecting yourself, protecting your home because iron deters things or for using it against someone. So there's a few really cool little things in here that I did like. Yeah, and there's a couple of like I especially liked the the chapter on baths. Um, so the water spells chapter was quite good. Um, you know, there's a bath for increased business, um, but it's really good. It says, however, it should not be taken more frequently than once every three or four months. Too frequent, too frequent use nullifies its effects. I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Um, <laughs> but I liked it because it's got parsley, cinnamon, nutmeg, and brown sugar in it. And I liked the idea of the sugar like a sweetening hoodoo spell. You know, obviously yeah. a lot of his spells are hoodoo based um, and Pennsylvanian Dutch witch doctor based. Um, you know, there's some, there's a bath to release emotional energy with rye flour, which I thought was really interesting. Mm. Um, I plan on giving that one a go. Um, and there's a bath for self-discipline, which is really good because we're just coming into the time of year where the cherry blossoms come out. So the cherry I blossoms will be out and you, we can do that one. <laughs> I totally need some self-discipline. Yeah, so do I at the moment. Um, but there was one thing that I found with his works that I know I sort of questioned how you could sort of know it. So with each of these things on reversing spells, you know, he talks about reversing a spell with water, with fire, with earth. One of the things he talks about is that it's of them being effective if the person who's cast the curse on you having done the spell using this element. It's sort of like how do you know what they've used? Like, yeah. I guess, the, I mean, isn't there a thing – in and you know hoodoo and and those sort of practices much better than I do. Wasn't there a thing about telling someone that you've cast a spell on them? Um, yeah, something about um, I have read in the past. I don't know where, but I have heard people claim that it works. It only works if the person's aware that it has been cast on you, sort of thing. Yeah, and but then you know, in a lot of other practices of witchcraft. Like, you never let the person know. So, I don't know, to each their own sort of thing. But, yeah, I guess, I don't know, some people feel like the need to say, hey, you've been cursed. Yeah. But even then, surely they're not going to sit down with you over a cup of tea and say, hey, this is how I've done it. If you want to reverse <laughs> you no, know, do this, this and this. Like, yeah, I guess, I guess because with Hoodoo there's a lot of sort of named things like, 
you know, I'm going to hot foot powder you right out of town, buddy, Um, (laughs) you know, or that sort of stuff. Um, I guess that might um, might influence it. But, yeah, it is a mismatch, but it's funny because I find, you know, I've got half a dozen or maybe a dozen bookmarks in here that are just useful little things. Um, Yeah. You know, his incense from the kitchen is kind of a good little thing. On page 50, um, there's his kitchen spices. Now, you know how I feel about people using their kitchen herbs. <laughs> it's, I'm, not, I'm not too fond of it. Um, spices are kind of different because, you know, we can't all grow spices. Um, yeah. You know, I, as much as I'd love to have a coffee tree, I a coffee bush, I it really isn't going to grow down here. Um, but one of the ones he's got is a blessing of concord, cinnamon and allspice combined in equal parts, um, places a smooth and witty feeling into the place where it is burned. It encourages social affairs and discourages jealousy between people. Um, a bit of frankincense can be used to raise the vibration. I can see that being a really nice um, incense to burn before you get a bunch of magical practitioners in one place. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, he also has his own type of holy anointing oil, oil which he calls or Moses oil, um, which is found at Exodus thirty twenty three, um, and it's a so it's a biblical oil um, that's for anointing and bits and pieces. But he's obviously made his own version with myrrh, cinnamon, calanus, and um, cassia. Um, seems like a nice little oil as well. Yeah, no, he's definitely got some um, pretty cool and interesting little recipes. There was one thing, though, he did mention, and he mentioned sort of his importance to it, and in, in that is I think he mentioned starting every day and starting every day, but, like, praying constantly and, like, the power of prayer. And I have, I don't know, it's just not something that I – click with and like you know to each your own I have no issue with him and if that works that's great but it's not something that I've ever really tried is it something that you've ever sort of had in your practice yeah actually prayer has come into my practice a lot more um you know very back in my early when I thought I might be Wiccan days um or when the only magic around (laughs) was Wiccan um I I prayed to the goddess and um and didn't find it really effective because it felt like it felt like Christianity to me. It felt mm. like um, it felt like praying and giving over agency to a higher being. Um, yeah. Then, so I went away from that, and of course went away from Wicca entirely. Um, and then, more recently, with the work I've been doing with Gordon White stuff, he has a lot of stuff on prayers and different prayers, like um, prayers to the different planets to greet the day and things like that. And and I've started using it more in that way, more in a magical tech way. Um, so, okay. like, someone gave a friend gave me the long hidden friend, and it has you know different psalms and things in it to use for different things and I haven't really del- dived that deep into it but I have really enjoyed um the saint work that we've been doing as part of the rune soup courses and stuff and I found working with some of the saints especially Saint Expedite um really very useful to yeah. say their prayers but it's more of a mag- magical tech thing like it's less of a, a devotional prayer. And like I think some of his prayers in this are very um, magical tech, but some of them are also very um, quite devotional. Um, yeah. You know, and, and, I, and I quite – he doesn't seem to be discriminating about which prayers he wants to use because he's got Islamic prayers in there and he's got saints' prayers and he's got um, – what does he call them? Um, Yoruba, Nigerian prayers and, and different stuffs about the, what do they call them? The Obe and. Uh, um, yeah, what was it? Obeya and Wanga. Yeah. Um, which, you know, and, and for me, that's the stuff I won't really touch because I feel like the the 
those things I don't have any connection with. And like you've you've worked with them, but yeah, they don't work for me. Um, yeah, I don't know. I find working yeah with that, and I think the, your reasoning is the same reason myself that I've never really felt comfortable with it. Is it sometimes to me feels like groveling or asking for power from another deity or a being and sort of lessening yourself and I've always sort of wondered it's like well shouldn't you be and like you know this is just my opinion for my practice it's nothing against anyone and how they practice this but I always felt like I I shouldn't be asking permission from someone else for power or asking and using that as a source of power like I'd rather have that as an internal thing and coming from something within myself rather than going to another being and saying I want to do this can you aid me like I know I'd rather I guess do the footwork myself so I've never been able to connect to prayer like that but then I like how you say with tech stuff it's a bit more like focused meditation in a sense of you're trying to connect and have more of an equal relationship and balance with things like Mars or Mercury or whatever rather than you know groveling yeah, and I think it's it's interesting because um, um so I think it's interesting because the the prayers to the planets are very commanding. Like yeah. you know, like it's it's obsequious not obsequious, it's um you know, you praise them, but then you um you back it up with uh, do not disobey me, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> more of a commanding situation. Yeah, let me um, let me just grab the prayer for Sunday um, and I'll, I'll read it out because it is an interesting sort of um, and it does, does use the word God so nobody freak out. Um, <laughs> no one burst into flames, please. Yeah, yeah. In the name of the Almighty and the Supreme God, I conjure you, Lord Sun, the Illuminator, the King of all stars, the begetter of vision, O Sun, who nurtures and causes the herbs and the trees to bear fruit, who adorns the whole world with majesty, who banishes adversities in the darkness, who divides the beautiful things from the ugly ones, O Sun, the embellishment of priceless things, the beauty and the majesty of pearls, gold and precious stones the glory of kings and the thoughts of judges. I conjure you, son, Lord Son, inconceivable, incomprehensible, who sees the powers of heaven and understands the splendours of the supreme. I conjure you, Lord Son, candle that burns before the dreadful god Sabaoth. Do not disobey me. I conjure you in your following names. Mithkanos, Doriel, Sinai, Madoel, Litropa, Frictael, Pelkadon, Andropor, Imedion, Alianos, Garuru, in your names, grant your grace and power and virtue in the present work I want to attempt. Turn back your foul fortune from me and bring me only good fortune. Amen. Now, that's a prayer I'm comfortable saying. Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's commanding a planet under the sight of God or being whatever, you know, all-encompassing power that you you know you want to use now there's a whole suite of those there's you know there's one for every day and I found that when I do them my life goes a bit smoother um see yeah they remind me a lot more of more of the stuff you find in high magic sort of stuff yeah like in Jason Miller's sort of text he has a similar one where he's you know you command the different spirits for the different um compass sides to do your bidding like he's you know like a kizo a beck bullheaded guardian of the you know what is it the north or whatever remember your vows and fill the throne that's been set for you you know to command out these beings to do your bidding rather than groveling and asking you know for assistance yeah yeah it's um it's not yeah it's it's standing in respect and not bowing in supplication, you know. Yeah. Um, which definitely makes a big difference. Um, there is a really great thing right at the end of the book um, where he goes through his whole multi-year process for making a a wand. <laughs> um, 
you know, going out into the um, into the forest and finding an oak tree, communing with the oak tree, um, giving it some fertilizer, coming back a year later, bring back some um, some ivy vines, train the ivy vines up the oak tree to <sighs> to the branches that you want them to, wind them tightly around. You know, it's it's a multi year process. It's like making sure that the vines that you you prune everything to make sure that the vines don't go everywhere and take over. Um, that you get this perfectly spiraled um, wand out the end, yeah, wow. and it's kind of kind of awesome. Like, yeah, um, I'm definitely considering whether I could do something like that with, um, you know, some of the different vines and and plants that I have growing, you know, I think it'd yeah, be, 100%. for me, it'd be more powerful to work with stuff that I have, um, that I tend magically than going into the forest and finding an oak tree, which, you know, there's lots of oak trees in Melbourne, but um, yeah, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I definitely admire his devotion in that aspect. And I do like that in the book, you do get a very strong sense of who he is and his vision regarding it. But yeah, I do, I absolutely love that idea and I was noticed a similar thing the other day. I saw someone that had a staff and they'd done something similar where they've, while the branch has been green, bent it and then wrapped it back on itself and allowed it to grow that way so that, yeah, when you do finally cut it, you've got this amazingly formed staff. So it's really amazing to see year, the years you put into it. So, yeah. Looking at this book, what is it that you'd like to sort of take away from it most? I, I think I'm going to do a couple of the baths. Um, I like the idea of the rye flower bath um, and I like the reversing spells with fire. Um, not that I have a lot of cause to reverse spells. Now, now that's not an invitation, people. Don't go, <laughs> don't go sending spells at me just because I said I don't have a lot of cause to reverse spells. Um, <laughs> no, I... Um, I do want to do a couple of the baths. Um, I like the increased business bath. Um, once I'm ready to do that, I'll I might give that a go. Um, the bath for self discipline with the cherry blossoms um, should be pretty cool to do once my cherry tree blooms. Not all, not that I'm allowed to steal the cherry blossoms until after they've fertilised into cherries. So I'll be capturing them as they fall. Um, I think. I think that's the, you know, that's the, they're the short term ones, but um, the long term one is definitely the staff of Hermes in the back couple of pages. I think I'm going to really see which, you know, I have wisteria growing, um, which the vines don't die back each year. So um, training that around a branch of something would be quite useful. Um, I've, I've got this sort of idea that maybe wisteria and ginkgo would be a beautiful combination because um, I have some ginkgo growing as well that it just might work with. Um, yeah, wow. You know, of course, I've got the hawthorns and blackthorns and things, um, but they don't – it might work on a blackthorn. Um, they just don't they're, – they're much more woody. Um, than yeah. the ginkgo and so I'm um, you know although oak's very woody and he's saying that ivy should work but mm, I don't know it's a six to one half dozen the other I might try it on a few different things and, and in a few years time we'll have a conversation about whether it worked <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's brilliant yeah um, so what about you um, I think I mostly just really want to try the iron water I'm really really massively intrigued with that one yeah, um, we, there's a bunch of different types of war water around. Like you can use just cayenne, pepper in water. A um, couple of people in my uh, life that I wouldn't mind getting rid of that way and I may just get onto it soon as well. <laughs> oh. Yeah, not cool. Awesome. So I'm pretty excited about this month's herb, which is rosemary. Yes. Because Rosemary is my all-time favourite, like, your standard mundane herb, and it's the first thing I ever grew. Like, I remember being a really young child and just being, for some reason, obsessed with rosemary and buying a rosemary plant, even though, you know, I didn't do anything with it. I've just always been absolutely intoxicated by the presence of rosemary. Yeah, it is 
um, it's the first herb I plant in any garden, you know, it really yeah. is. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's lots of folklore around rosemary in gardens and things like that, you know, saying they've, um, you know, plant it by your gate and no evil will yeah. enter. And then, you know, if rosemary flourishes, then the woman rules the house. Um, I think my <laughs> husband would debate that one, but our rosemaries do flourish. <laughs> I was going to say, I know that yours is flourishing lately, so I think it's saying something. <laughs> yeah, look, and I just, you're right, it's intoxicating, you know. The, the smell is instantly recognisable and tasty. <laughs> mm. and I really love how if you rub the leaves it leaves your fingers really sticky with it it's yeah it's such a great smell yeah exactly and and there's just so much you can do with it magically and medicinally um you know just ridiculous amounts of applications so yeah um like you said plenty by the garden it's the exact same thing that I do it's the first herb every time I get it go to a new home it's always there in a pot by the garden it's always one of those first ones it's in but what are some of the ways that you particularly love using it look I love it in a tea um it's you know it's one of the best pick me up morning teas um it's my go-to in my tea blend for when someone's sick so I'll often get um, lemon thyme, rosemary, um, and I'll put them all in a tea, some lemon balm if I've got some growing at the time, um, put them all in a tea and just force feed them to people who are sick um, <laughs> because their rosemary and thyme um, are antiviral, um, you know, they're antiseptic um they're an inflammatory so they're great in sore throats and when you've got inflammation in the sinuses and stuff just the act of drinking that steaming hot cup of tea and getting it all up into your sinuses and into your um into your body as well it's just it's just an amazing medicinal herb yeah no it's got it is absolutely fascinating in that regard um you know, there are so many applications for it medicinally. Um, it is, let me get my notes here. Um, so it is a carminative so it, it, and an antispasmodic. It's an antidepressant. Um, it's a rubefactant. Um, so the rubefactant means that it will um, increase circulation. Um, so you can use it in poultices and in use the oil. Um, you can put the essential oil into a carrier oil and use it in massage blends to help increase um, circulation. Um, it's antimicrobial um, and it's an amenagogue. So, again, overuse can bring on menses, but it's really we're talking massive overuse. This is not – there are no contraindications for um, rosemary. Um, there's in in older books, um, like if you pick up like John John Lust's herb book, um, he'll say you shouldn't drink lots of rosemary tea because it's bad for the liver. Um, but current medical um, practice doesn't say that. And you know, for using as reference, I'm using Medical Herbalism um, by David Hoffman. So serious medical books, not um, not just a nice herb book that tells you about it. Um, so David says that uh, rosemary is a circulatory and nervine stimulant. It has a toning and calming effect on the digestion, especially when stomach ex upset is accompanied by psychological tension. Thus, condi conditions appropriate for treatment with rosemary include flatulent dyspepsia with headache or depression. <laughs> so, you know, if your farts are giving you depression, no, <laughs> I'm being flippant. I'm being flippant. It, it's a, it's about having a grumbly tummy, and you you know you just feel awful. Um, uh, applied externally, it helps ease muscular pain, sciatica, and neuralgia. It also acts as a stimulant to both hair follicles and circulation is in the scalp, and thus may may be useful for the treatment of premature baldness. Um, 
so you know I don't know whether he's speaking from experience I haven't seen a picture of him um, <laughs> but rosemary is a great reds for dark hair so if you have you know dark brown black hair um, rosemary makes an amazing rinse for your hair it'll make it nice and shiny and darker um, you know there are as a medicinal herb it seems kind of boring like because it just does good things <laughs> um <laughs> it's a herb <laughs> what about you magically what do you like to use it for um absolutely everything honestly <laughs> it's one of those ones that i absolutely it's one of my favorite herbs i know it's such a basic but it is in everything it's always something i've got in the garden and so i normally do regular say um blessings of the house more so you know protection of the house and it's one of those things that it's often an ingredient in the water or the oil that I use is rosemary because it is great for protection same as smudging the house I absolutely love to smudge branches of it burning is an incense like it's got so many amazing uses and honey spells it's something that I really like to put into honey spells oh really that's um that's something I haven't used it for. I suppose there is a love connection with it as well. Um, yeah. Well, it's meant to be good luck to have in your wedding bouquet, and it was one that I actually did have in my wedding bouquet. I had rosemary and feathers. Rosemary and what? Feathers. Feathers. Different feathers. Yeah. Oh, Different gorgeous. Bouquet. Yeah, but um, um, yeah, because it's a, it's for mem- memory as well and remembrance and funeral yeah. herbs and things. But um, I haven't really used it for loves. But yeah, it says it's uh, the herb book by um, Franklin and Lavender talks about it being a herb of love. Um, all guests were greeted with a branch of rosemary wrapped in gold and ribbons, um, yeah. a garland for brides, brides, and even for queens. Yeah, and it was also sometimes presented as gifts to wedding guests as well. But then yeah. they go on to say it was also used at funerals. Like, Yeah. <laughs> I guess it's that you can kind of think that it's a love and remembrance thing. Um, yeah. You know, and this talk, they talk about things like um, tying sprigs of it to your arm to keep you merry and bright. And even one of them, the other um, her books, which is slightly more serious, suggests that you make a poultice of it and put it on your right arm to help with depression so but I think that's the scent you know really when you come down to it it's a smell Um, it is a really uplifting scent yeah um they also recommend that rosemary tea be taken to restore psychic energies after depletion and strengthen the aura Ah. um so yeah look they've got a rosemary wine where they say pour um poured some wine over the top strain and rebottle I've, I've never opened a bottle of wine and had it last a few days um so <laughs> you know mainly because i don't like vinegar but you know also drink the wine yeah. um yeah i know i've also heard of people saying burning rosemary along with juniper um to fumigate a home to drive out any illness it's been in there too and it was one of those herbs they used to burn a lot during the black death believing that it would sort of purify the air yeah, exactly. And they used it right up until like the early 80s in French hospitals um, to do the same. Mm. So um, I don't know whether it's actually got any sort of bacteri- antibacterial properties or whether I know people have also said smoke is generally something to sort of help cleanse things like yeah. scientifically. But um, it'd be interesting to see if there's any real ground to it or if it's more of a spiritual thing um yeah so i agree i think it's probably a little bit of both um you know there's lots of um things that we talk about rosemary in um in the hoodoo Her- herb and root magic book as well you know lots of pleasing home incenses and bringing good dreams and um paths and faithfulness and magic and you know so it's obviously has a wide thing of use um in hoodoo as well yeah and even this i know another thing that i do do quite a lot which i think i found originally from a hoodoo book was 
having a cluster of herbs hanging upside down in the home normally near the door is another sort of protection thing and rosemary sort of always mentioned in there yeah um in the black toad from Gemma gary she says it's wise indeed to have rosemary growing in the garden and keep it fa- keep it to fat to keep it fashioned into charms to hang within the home as a potent plant charm, protecting against all evil spirits and calamity. Such a presence brings also good fortune, success in enterprise, and attracts love to individuals who carry it. So pretty much all of the things we've talked about, Rosemary's great for. (laughs) (laughs) It is definitely, like I said, it's got to be one of those things that I always have in my garden. I am with the distilling it in the still um it's a fantastic um herb for that because it has the it it, the oil comes out of it quite easily um and i've it was the first herb that i distilled um in the copper still and and was so thrilled to get so much oil out of it but the hydrosol is amazing as well um you know it's so antimicrobial that it really doesn't need preservatives in it um it just keeps smelling better and better um the older it gets to me um it's amazing to clear a room the spray just just spray the hydrosol around and clear the room putting it in washing water you know um and different things like that uh a really great um the making perfumes of it to um have your um, help you concentrate in work, you know, again, yeah. that willpower thing. Um, but, yeah, I, I ended up with a lot of sticks um, left over after I stripped all the leaves off for this, for the still. And the sticks are great to make into little wreaths um, or little pentacles if you like making those and things like that because they s- continue to smell of rosemary for years. Like they oh. really do. They're amazing. I once had these massive branches I'd cut off a friend's plant in the back of my car and I accidentally left them in the boot for a few days as you do and my car smelled phenomenal for months after. It just infused everything. It was so, so good. But those sticks that you mentioned too, they burn really well when you dry them. They really crackle and spark and they're really good sort of almost as a smudge stick by themselves without the leaves because you'll find they'll just smolder for ages. Oh, that's a really good point. I'm going to have to do that. I've got a right behind me right now, I've got about a 60-litre bucket of rosemary <laughs> that we pruned <laughs> from out the front. We've got a prostrate um, rosemary that's it's called Blue Star and it, it's just an incredible, incredible um, variety and it really needed a hard prune, but yeah, I have this massive tub of rosemary that needs to be dealt with. Um, oh, it's next time you've got a fire going, chuck a handful on it and just watch how much it crackles when you've got it bone dry. It's amazing. Yeah, definitely have going to have to try that. Um, you know, as a tincture, it's great for, again, um, when you're feeling a bit under the weather, but really the tea is so delicious um, that you want to have – you want to have the tea, you know. Mm. Um, don't be afraid of the tea. It's not as strongly tasting as you might think it is. Um, so, yeah, I really encourage people to have the tea or to even consider the, um, like, making it into baths um, and things like that because it's just such a good herb, you know. Yeah, no, definitely. So what do you think you're going to do with it for the month? I'm actually really curious to try the tea. I have never even considered putting rosemary into tea before. So it's definitely going to be iron water Mm -hmm. and I think just absolutely smothering myself in rosemary more than I already do. (laughs) In the past I've used it a lot, even just as a perfume, just like breaking the leaves up into like balling it in your fingers and rubbing it onto your skin. It just absolutely sticks to you the scent of it so i don't know i'm sure i'm gonna find a thousand and one things i'm gonna do with it well i look forward to um to seeing what you get up to with it i think um <laughs> you know i've got to deal with all of this rosemary behind me so i'm thinking i might make some of those smudge sticks that sounds like a great idea um i do want to run some of them through the still um and i think i'm gonna i'm, I'm trying the 
wake up in the morning, have rosemary tea because um, it's really a morning tea. Like you really want to have it in the morning. You shouldn't have it at night because it may keep you awake. It is a stimulant. Um, so there's those. I feel like, um, you know, it's not a herb that I'd turn into a balm. Like it doesn't have that. I've made it into a balm and I didn't love it, you know. Okay. It's so much other things. Like it smells beautiful. Like it's a beautiful perfume balm and stuff. And it might be nice for concentration and stuff, but it's certainly not a flight balm or something like that. Maybe it's a grounding balm after after work, you know, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah, maybe to sort of strip everything off. I think the other thing that I'm also going to do since you keep reminding me of twigs is have a few branches that I might carve spells into and then burn to release them. Oh, yeah, that sounds good. Actually, that was one of the things in um, a century of spells that I didn't talk about. Um, there was a not burning but burning things, the exact opposite, water. Um, he had a suggestion for writing spells Um Onto, onto your paper with a water-soluble ink. Um, the spell is then prayed over in the usual way, so activated in your usual way, um, and then the ink is washed off the paper into the water. The water is then used as the medium for the spell. The sp person for whom the spell is made can bathe in the water or the water may be used for washing floors, etc. In some cases, the water is sprinkled over an area where wow. the person is to walk. And then he says, talks about rice paper, which dissolves in water as well. Um, and I kind of like that. You know, I must have missed that bit in the book, and yeah, that sounds absolutely amazing. I really like that idea. It's near the end, near is on page one hundred twenty eight when he with his little written spells area. Um, his spoken spells part is awful. Like, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so let's skip back over that. Um, <laughs> yeah, the so it's really great as a written spell. Um, I think that's a fantastic idea. Actually, there was something. Um, in one of Gordon White's courses last week about um, people who burned manuscripts and then mixed the ashes with water and drank the ashes to imbibe the the knowledge of the manuscript. Now, I don't think I really want to do that, um, <laughs> but I th it might work with the, um, the rosemary ashes. Ah, that's an, yeah, that's an interesting idea. You know, obviously it's no, not going to no, be very he... pleasant. Yeah, yeah, no, and I know he did speak about that a fair bit and I've heard um, there's another guy, I can't remember his name, I'll link it in the show notes though, who does a lot of work on putting intent and energy and meditating over water and then drinking it to sort of power yourself with that. I've got a friend who's absolutely fascinated by his works, yeah. but um, he touched in that book a fair bit about that, about how water is so, I don't know, can work better at different vibrational frequencies like I know he mentioned like water should be at this degree of temperature to work better for this and this and this he does seem pretty um fascinated by it and it's not something I've really worked with but yeah it'd be interesting with the rosemary ashes that is pretty interesting I mean obviously with any ashes well with any wood ashes um you wouldn't want to be doing this all the time because you mix wood ash um with water and you will make pot ash which is caustic so you know it but if you're only if you're missing fresh ash and you know you're just drinking it in a little bit you're probably not gonna um have any ill effects but um yeah well look it sounds like we've got some amazing things to do this month yeah definitely i'm a lot more interested than i sort of thought i would be by this one book and this one herb. Yeah. When I suggested it, I was like, you know what, that's a book that I just haven't used as much as I thought I would when I first read it. And I think you're right. It was the the whole prayer thing, especially when I first got it, putting me right off. Um, but I'm in a different place to look at it now. Um, oh, I will say that there's a herb section in the middle. Um, be very vigilant. He doesn't have any... Um, botanical names so don't um <laughs> so maybe use it with caution yeah yeah that is something i noticed like i have found in different hoodoo books uh lojon the conqueror root i feel like 
he he mentions he does mention the Latin name for it of what he thinks it is, but I've found so many different authors that say that that root is a completely different plant, and it seems like no one can agree. And no one can agree on pine John either. <laughs> yeah, and yet it's like you know chew the root rah rah rah, but it's like well what's if you've got a thousand different plants, do we know? You know, the sort of outcome of chewing on the roots of different plants. No one seems to agree with what this plant actually is. Yeah, so proceed with caution. Um, yeah. Common sense. Yeah, so look, we've got a bunch of great stuff to go on with this month and um, I'm going to get us to sort of stop the recording very soon. But um, is there anything you wanted to tell anyone before we, we sign off? No, no, just thanks for listening as always and thanks to everything that we do work with, those spirits and such. Yeah, and that's it. It's, um, thanks for the to the sun for coming back in the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> um, I, I really have missed you um, and I really enjoy the fact that I'm starting to be able to spend some time in my garden and um, thanks to all my plants in my garden because they're really um, starting to pop back out their little heads out of the ground and... Um, there's a lot of reshuffling and, and reorganising going on in my garden. I'll show you all once it's all finished. Um, but, yeah, that, thanks, guys, for listening. Tell your friends. Um, you know, I love seeing it when someone recommends our podcast. It's really exciting. Um, I heard it is. There was a great comment um, on someone else's Instagram where they recommended us and said they don't get carried away in just going off on tangents. They just talk about magic. And I, that was the hugest compliment. I just loved it. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. Um, you can find us on Twitter at the Garden of Ink and oh, Sorry, not Twitter. You can find us on Instagram at Garden of Ink and Bones. You can find us on Twitter, but we I really don't use it. Um, I don't use Twitter. <laughs> you can um, find us on Facebook at the Garden of Ink and Bones. And um, if you have any questions, just send us a message at questions at gardenofinkandbones.com. Um, that's all from us this month. And uh, we'll see you all at the new moon, which is less than a month away now. Yeah. See you all next time. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>